I hope you are able to see the connects from all the things that we had discussed over the last few days, right? So you must have got DBPF coming, you must have got the uh, monolith to microservices change, the whole reason for why we are going to this containers and Kubernetes architecture. You must have got uh, service meshes, you guys ran a service mesh, at least you uh, uh, deployed some rate limiting on a service mesh before. So I hope you are able to see the connects to the things that we were doing over the last few days. And now we will uh, come back to our uh, normal sessions. So this session, especially unlike uh, yesterday's session on eBPF, is going to be complete opposite. It's going to be very high level, which is on application layer networking. We'll have one session today and the remaining three sessions tomorrow. So um, let's get started. Okay, so I hope you guys know what this is. The seven layer network model, I hope you guys have all uh, learned about it, right? And the things you have seen over the last few days have been all over the lower half of this uh, seven layer model. So for instance, uh, and, and it goes from up to down L1 to L7. So for instance, this is L2. We did some stuff in L2. Do you remember what we did? We did bridges, we did V8, all of that is L2. This is L3. What is the most popular protocol in L3 that you've all heard of? What does L3 remind you of? IP, right? So IP comes in L3 and this is L4. Have you heard of some protocols in L4? UDP. TCP, UDP, right. Which we have not done, but yes. So why all these layers, right? And we don't really talk about L5 and L6, we just talk, to, talk about L7. And this is the application layer. Why all these layers, right? So at every layer, we feel that the layer below it does some job, does it well, but there's something missing. You need to again look at it at a higher level, not that deep, at a higher level, and there's some requirements that are not met by the lower level. So what does L3, IP do? It assigns IP addresses, it does routing, everything is done. But transport layer says that is not enough for me. You, you are able to route from A to B, but I want connections, end-to-end -end connections, something that sticks, right? The, the TCP handshake you have heard. So it, it ensures that once you've done the connection, you can keep sending packets on the same connection. It gives you connection. It gives you reliability. If a packet drops, it able, it's able to resend. So, so that the application is not, or at least you are not going to sit and code that again and again, right? If a packet is dropped, do this. It takes care of all of that for you. So if TCP does all of this, why do we need L7? What are we missing from... L4 that we want in L7. So this is looking at it at a high level. TCP only looks at it in the uh, looks at all the data in the form of bytes. It's a very byte oriented protocol. But at at a user level, you don't care about bytes. Suppose you're a user who is going to log into Twitter, right? You want to see tweets. You want to like send tweets, receive tweets or whatever. You don't want to send and receive bytes. You don't care about bytes at that level. So you want to see the logical data, the logical message that you're sending. And you don't care about the underlying bytes that make up that data. So that is what L7 um, handles. Have you heard of any L7 protoc uh, protocols? HTTP is the most popular and is the topic of this one. Did someone uh, say something else as well? FTP, thank you. Right, so th these uh, layer protocols are handling stuff at a message level. Now let's just look at the protocol. Right? Why so many protocols? What do protocols do? Protocol is basically just like some sort of a standard that two parties have agreed upon. So say here, I am talking in, talking in English, so you are all able to understand me. If I were going to talk in Chinese, you would not understand. Right? So first we have, under, we have understood that we are going to communicate in English. But even in English, it's just not sufficient. Right? Suppose somebody says hi to me and I respond back saying something like uh, 1155. And you're going to be confused, what am I even saying? So there's also a standard that if someone says hi, you respond back with hi, hello, good morning, bye, something. There's a bunch of responses you can give, but time is not one of them. So there's a standard that is agreed upon that if you say something, these are the possible responses that I come up with. And protocol just means that two parties have agreed upon this standard. Now take these protocols, TCP, UDP, or even say HTTP, FTP. So suppose you, you guys have all used HTTP, right? Anything you use in the browser is HTTP. So suppose now I have a browser in my laptop and I'm logging into facebook.com and using the HTTP protocol. So when did I and Facebook agree upon this protocol? Like how did such an agreement come from such two parties so far away, right? 
So this protocol, all, all these agreements have been done in the world by some organizations like IETF, all these RFCs and all that you've heard of, right? These organizations come up, come to the standard that, okay, this is what is the HTTP protocol. This is what party A will say. This is how party B will respond back. And if you follow this, you have successfully implemented the HTTP protocol and anyone else who agrees to implement the HTTP protocol will be able to talk to you. And this is how two parties are able to talk to each other using standardized protocols such as all of these. Now we just saw you guys mentioned HTTP, FTP. This is a list from Wikipedia of all the, not all these, still way more, of some popular layer 7 protocols, right? And you might have seen some of these, you may not have heard of some of these and so on. So let's just look at some of them just a little bit, right? So this is the network file system and it is used to access just make a, a distributed file system so that you can access even remote files like it is running locally on your machine itself. And something else that you may or may not have heard of is NTP. It's called Network Time Protocol. Basically in distributed systems, you have a system, I have a system, both our systems will not have the same time. You need to somehow agree upon that this is the exact time that for you it's 11.55, for me it's 11.55. And for this there's an NTP uh, network time protocol that you're able to talk to a server and get that this is the exact time right now. And uh, finally you have RTMP, real time messaging protocol that you can see here. And it is uh, actually a video streaming uh, protocol. And for instance, this is what people use if they have a video and they want to upload that to YouTube, right? It's apparently the process called ingestion. And this is the protocol they use to stream their video and send it onto an online server such as YouTube. RTMP and then there's RTMPS, the secure version of RTMP. So this list contains so many protocols, like SIP is what we use in telecommunication for uh, talking. This is all SMTPs for mail, right? So all of these are L7 protocols that each do some functionality of their own. But the topic of today is HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And yes, you all use it, right? Every time you go to a website, you using HTTP. So HTTP is the backbone of the internet. It is what forms the entire world wide web. And HTTP follows a client and server model. So you have a client by which we mean any web browser that wants to talk to a website, a browser becomes a client. And you have the web server itself and that is the server. And according, this is, I mentioned right, protocol. So a client will send a message using the HTTP, uh, send a HTTP request message using the protocol. The server understands that, it does whatever the client is asking you to do and it responds with using the HTTP response. So this is take a proper example of you entering a URL in your browser. So you say I want to go, to, let's say uh, you say something like github.com slash your, uh, your name and some repo that you have, right? This is the URL that you put in the browser. So the moment you hit enter, the browser has to get something for you. So it sends a HTTP request message to the GitHub server. It has some uh, IP address for uh, GitHub, so it goes and asks GitHub to get you this repo, uh, this path to the repo. And then what does GitHub server do? It sees that you want your name slash repo, which means it has to get all the files in that repo and so on. And then it has to send that in the response. It is not sending the GitHub files itself. This is just the GitHub uh, UI, right? Which means you need to see the list of files you have, the list of contributors, something like languages, all those things. So it sends all that information to, uh, it ca calculates all that information and sends it and the browser will then display that information. And you know it is displaying using some languages like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, it does all this for the displaying. Right, so this is how the HTTP request and response is used for you to do any browsing in your web. Uh, and what you type? In the browser is called the URL, the uniform resource locator. You must have typed like hundreds and thousands of them in your life. So let's just see what it looks like. So the first is the scheme. This is HTTP or HTTPS. Have you ever typed anything else over here? Have you seen anything else in the URL in the front? What have you seen? Devo, you were nodding. What have you used? Sometimes you've used mail too. If you click on a mail link, say some professor's web page or something, right? If you click on the mail link, it'll automatically create a mail too. 
So that is also one of the possible schemes that you can use. FTP, you can use FTP in the browser itself if you put FTP over here. Uh, next is www, you can use it, you can skip it, uh, it works exactly the same. The third is the actual URL itself, the host address. You use DNS if you use something like facebook.com. That day when we ran the Nginx server, we put the IP there. So internally the DNS converts to IP, so you can either use an IP or you can use a DNS which converts into an IP. And this is the machine where the request is going to go to. And uh, then you have the .com, it could be .ac .in for you know academic institutions, you've seen all different uh, kinds here. Uh, usually we, for like facebook.com you don't specify a port, but if you run a server of your own you might specify a port. There is the uh, default ports for it to go to. Uh, path slash resource is also something important because that is the request path, that is what is the resource that you even want in that uh, machine and then the rest are not very useful. So let's first inspect a website. I want you to go to, you can pick any website if you want, uh, but you can use the uh, full stack networking's uh, web page that uh, IIIED has set up. You can go to this website in your browser and this should work hopefully, no VMs, no none of that confusion, you can just use your computer as it is. And you have some version of inspect, okay now this is where different browsers will have different things, but you have some version of uh, inspect so that you can see some more information, right? Uh, let's just get this thing up in your browser. You guys able to inspect yet? F12 should work. Is right click and inspect or somewhere on the top you can do the inspect. And the bottom, you can click the network tab in the uh, Okay, if you've seen in the network tab, on the right side, you'll see some details. Headers, cookies, request, response. And you can see that specifically what is written over here. It says, I've just zoomed in, you'll need to see closer. It will say get, HTTPS, host, and file name. So I guess this matches whatever I showed, right? This is the host, this is the path. Slash FSN is a path on IIID server for full stack networking's web page. So this is the request that was sent and um, yeah I guess you need to just scroll down in the right side there to see the request headers. So to see the request in more detail. You'll see request headers there and there you can see what the HTTP request really looked like. When you hit the enter in the browser, there was a lot of things. For instance, I did in a Mac, so it's sending the Mac information also. If you did in Linux, you'll get Linux there. You'll see some cookie related information. You'll see a lot, lot of information being sent in the request. And below that, you'll also see response headers. And the response headers should be something I guess, I guess it should look, look similar for all of you. You might get 200 if this is the first time. I got 304 because I was looking at it again. You will see some keep alive, cache, etc. Right? So this is what the response should look like. So if you're done with the browser, we can look at the same web page but using the curl tool. You might have used the curl tool multiple times uh, across our sessions. We used it before we introduced it but um, you can use curl. This is the uh, host name you want to curl and Dashly actually is just verbose so you actually get some more details, some inner details of what curl does when it sends a request. So that you're able to see all the headers etc. And you should see the exact same thing you saw in the browser when you do curl. Just get a little bit comfor comfortable with curl, we will, we might need to use it. 
metabolites. Okay, so I guess you all seen requests and response in some form, the browser or curl doesn't matter. So let's get into what a HTTP message looks like or not. Okay. Have, have you done the curl command? Show sure, fans please. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, good. So let's look at the HTTP message. So we saw that a request was sent and a response was received. Both of them are HTTP messages. So what what is so special about a HTTP message, right? How how is it formatted and all that? Basically it's actually very, very simple. It's just plain text and it's separated by new lines. That is all a HTTP message is. Either a request or a response is just plain text. Uh, so you have the start line, you have some headers, and then you have a body. Headers are a lot of what you saw before, such as um, cookie, colon, this, connection, keep alive, accept encoding, all of these are headers. Headers are just metadata that the either side wants to send, the, the client wants to send the server or the server wants to send the client. So if you have seen this content type header, this you might have be more familiar with. For instance, it tells what format is this data that is being sent. This body is the data, right? So it is saying what is the format of that body? Because it's just binary, the browser doesn't know what to do with it. If it's an audio, it has to play. So it's the content type header actually says what the format of the message is. Say MPEG or is it an image, which means you have to display it. If it's a video, it could play it. If it's a PDF, it will actually need some PDF viewers as able to show you all the PDF options, right? Zoom, search, all that. Okay, so let's just see a sample request and response. I said there's a body line, there's a start line, right? So this is the start line. For a request, it says get something in the path and HTTP version. Get is a method. There are multiple methods. You have get, put, etc. This is the URI and this is the HTTP version. And then there's all of these metadata headers. And the response has again the HTTP version, status and status phrase. This you must have seen. 200 is an okay, 400, 404, all 404 is not found and all that, right? So this is a status, status uh, code and status message so that the browser knows what was the response of, the, what is the status of the response. So now the hands-on begins, we are going to write an HTTP server, but not from scratch, from some code that has already been provided. So go to the GitHub repo uh, that we had shared before, and uh, there is, I think it's called 23.1.http, and please open the exercise folder, not the answer folder. <laughs> the answer does contain the answers, and I hope you won't look at it right at the beginning. Uh, so yeah, just get the, uh, Go to the exercise folder, there will be an echo.c. You can, if you are able to git clone, you can git clone, else you can just copy that uh, file and paste it in your machine. It should be called echo.c. Uh, please get a copy locally. Uh, so please open the file also. Let's just look at the file a little bit and then go ahead with the answer. You don't need to understand exactly what happens there. So basically this is a TCP server. It opens sockets. So it's a L4 server. You don't need to understand the code completely, but it will be good if you can actually look through it and understand bits and pieces of it. Okay. 
URL any type. You're able to see it over here. Type this. So those are able to get the file, just uh, take a look at the file. Uh, the repo is on Slack now if you're not able to find the repo. Okay, let's just look at the code a little bit before you, so you can understand what to do, right? So, uh, the main actually starts the server, but we will not uh, bother too much about it. Basically, there's this function called handle client. I can write in handle uh, client. And that is the one that every time a client calls the server, this function is going to be called. And right, what it does is receive the message from the client, call this function called handle request, which should hopefully give it the response as well, and just return the response. So handle request is on line 41. And right now, so I call it an echo server. What is an echo in real life? And yeah, it just gives you back whatever you say, right? So exactly the same. This echo server, whatever you send it, it will respond back with the exact same thing, which means in terms of code, the handle request will literally just copy the request into the response buffer and give that as a response. So first, so this handle request is the one being called right now by handle client. So first I want you to compile the echo.c, the instruction set, sorry. Uh, compile the uh, echo.c, build the binary and try to run it. It should hopefully compile without any issues and you should be able to run the server. It should, it will say starting server on and it will give you some port as well. I hope you guys have GCC installed on your machine. You need to do GCC. I think there's a readme in the repo. You need to do GCC echo.c. Are you able to start the server and see the message that your server has started? Now in another terminal, you can test your server, test the echo part of your server. You can use the ng command that we saw on the very first day, uh, local host because your machine, your server is running on your, on your machine itself and 9091 because that's the port that um, the server code was configured to use. And if you type anything, you should get the response back from the server, which is the exact same thing. 
can try looking at the logs on you can try looking at the NC terminal or you can go look at your server logs also to see what the server does. So you are able to see the response at NC, are you able to see run the NC command? Yeah, so when you run NC, it contacts the server and then if you type hello, it sends that message. That is a pinging. Okay, this is a bit. So you don't need to ping this uh, command that I gave here is what I meant when you had to ping the server. So uh, show of hands, were you able to get the response back from the server and uh, please check the server logs also, you will be able to see that it uh, typed all of this. So now you have an echo server which gives you exactly whatever request is, whatever it receives, it will send it back to it. So let us see that if we send a HTTP request, what are we getting? So if you go to your browser and type colon 1991 and hit enter, what we saw before was it will send a get request to the server. So on the server it will send this request, but right now it is not doing anything, it just it sends the same thing back which the browser doesn't understand. So the browser will not display anything or worst case it will just display the same thing again. But so this is not HTTP, but you can at least see what request is the server receiving. So just go to your browser type 1991 and in the echo server you will be able to see these logs of what did the browser actually ask from this server. Yeah, so curl is also an equivalent of a HTTP GET request. So if you do a curl locally you will, you should be getting something similar, a HTTP request being sent to a TCP server. Uh, so using either curl or the browser I hope you are able to see the, brow the server logs saying that this was the HTTP request that it received that it doesn't know what to do with, right? It just sent the same thing back. Okay, so we saw that this is a simple TCP server which just sends it, which just responds back to the same thing. And when it got a HTTP request, it didn't handle it properly. It didn't talk as per the protocol. It just sent the same thing back. And either the browser or curl, they were also not able to handle it. They just sent the same thing. They just displayed the same thing back. This is not HTTP, right? HTTP means you have to respond back using the HTTP protocol. So to convert this echo server into a HTTP server, you need to talk the HTTP language. So that's, that means that the response you send back, it can no longer be just an echo, it has to be a response of the HTTP type. What does a HTTP response look like? I, like I said before, it's all plain text. So your work should be to send, send this plain text instead of the same, res, uh, same request itself, right? So there's a few steps that you'll need to do. First of all, there is a function there called handle HTTP request. In the echo.c, could you just open echo.c and see that there is a function there called handle HTTP request. It should have uh, some question marks inside because that is a part that has not yet been completed. Are you all able to locate handle HTTP request? So the reason your code was working before is because it was the handle client which is a couple of functions down, was actually calling handle request function. Now if you create a new handle HTTP request function, you need your handle client to call this one instead. So in handle client, you need to change the HTTP request, let's see, ha handle request call to handle HTTP request call. Let me just show you in the code. There's a function on line 72 called handle request function call to handle request function. You need to change this handle request to handle HTTP request which is the new function that you are going to write to respond in the HTTP way. So you will first need to change the way you are handling this request. So I want all of you to change line 72 to handle HTTP request. And this is the format you need to use, right? The one on line 31, handle underscore HTTP underscore request. Okay, so did you all change it to the handle HTTP request? Right, show of hands. 
Yeah, but there's no point changing it to handle HTTP request if it is not doing it. So now you have to change handle HTTP request function. Basically replace the question mark code to now send a HTTP response. So this was what the response looks like. First, a status. First, the status code. Uh, status, which is version followed by status 200 OK. We are going to say it's all successful, so 200 OK. Next, some response headers. We'll just look at the next slide. What are the response headers that are actually necessary for bare minimum that is necessary for the curl or your browser request to work. Then there is a blank line. This blank line is actually very important. So the browser knows that this is where metadata stops, stops and the response starts. And then the response body, you can put anything you want over here. So the thing is that you'll need to note is that wherever there is a line end, the format is slash r slash n, both of them together. So if you write the response code, you need to end it with slash r slash n. If you write the content type, you have to end it with slash r slash n. A blank line is also that. And then the response body and then that, right? So anywhere you want to do a delimiter between all the points here, you need to use backslash r backslash n. And the three question marks should now be replaced with response code, a new line and whatever body you want. All of them with ending with slash r slash n. Let's just put this in and then we can put the headers in. In between the response code and the new line, we need to put the headers in. If you are having some trouble with the format and stuff, you can take a look at the answer. But you can try writing it on your own if you want to get the feel. If you try it without the headers, in case you are done, you can try without running without the headers and you might see that it doesn't actually work. Which is why a couple of headers are actually essential. Did I write it? I didn't write it here. Alright, so these two headers are necessary, content type and content length. So content length should be the length of your hello world. So I just do counting and put the number of characters there. And content type is just text plain, was it? Explain. <coughs> and everything needs to be separated by slash r slash n. If you're having trouble at any point, you can look at the answer server so that you can see any formatting issue or something that you have done. Hopefully your code still compiles at the end of it so you can try compiling and running the server again. Okay, the response code has to be HTTP 1.1, 200 and okay. The headers, you have to write the entire thing content type, plain, text plain, content length and this has to be the length of whatever message you are sending. If it's hello world, it has to be 10, is it? 10 or 9, whatever. So it should be the response code, both the headers, everything ending with slash r slash n, a new line, slash r slash n, the body, slash r slash n. And you'll know it works if either the curl or the browser is able to actually display your hello world or whatever you typed there instead. So for those of you who are done, right? You can congratulate yourself for one second that you have written a HTTP server. But actually it is not. It is like 1% of a HTTP server. So first of all, we are just returning a simple response, right? We are just returning a string. But a HTTP server has a lot of higher level methods. This get, post, etc., right? So an actual server should be able to, it should take the request, is, is, right now it's just returning the same response no matter what the request is. It should take the request, it should analyze the request to see if it is a get request, it has to do something, it has to get a resource and give it. 
If it is a post request, it has to look at the message, see the data and do something with the data. So all of this is not handled by a code. So yeah, this is a very, very, very simple HTTP server. You, do we have to do this, this much of writing and this is just for one function, right? Do you have to write everything from scratch always? Not necessarily. So every language usually comes with a function, which are, with a library, which will do most of this inner coding of understanding whether it's a get request or a post request, what should it do for handling it, how to get the request data, all of that. So most languages come with something. Uh, in Python, for instance, one of the most uh, uh, popular one is called Flask. Flask allows you to write a HTTP server with just like boy, uh, with just like annotations and stuff so that you can easily generate the code. So for instance, this is what a sample Flask application will look like. You just say route slash, this is the function to be done. So if you do curl of this, uh, the port slash, it will run this function and it will return hello world. So it makes most of your work much easier. You can actually see a server, a proper HTTP server with just one line of code, right? So Python comes with an inbuilt HTTP server module. There's, it has simple, it has multiple layers of it. We'll just see the simple one. And I kept saying this resource, right? URL stands for uniform resource locator. This resource is some files. And what Python server does is it converts your local, the, wherever you run it, right? If you run it in a directory, it run, converts that directory itself into the resource that it is serving. So just go to one, any one of your directories. I hope you have Python installed on your machine. If you do have, just go to one of your directories, which has like a lot of things, maybe, maybe downloads, right? It'll probably be lying like a lot of, lot of things will be lying around, probably half from our school, uh, Windows school itself. So just go to your downloads folder and do Python uh, 3. If you have, don't have Python 3, just do normal Python, dash m http dot server. Uh, there will be a little bit of version issue with this command. Uh, if you, if it's not running, uh, just raise your hands. We can, there might be a different version of the command for the Python version you run. And if it's, if it's successful, it will just print this, serving HTTP on port 8000. This should come. And for those who, for whom it works, you can go to a browser and see this thing. But uh, just, uh, yeah, just raise your hands if you're having trouble running uh, this command. Okay, now you can raise your hands if you were able to run the command. Okay, most of you. So if you are able to run the command, just go to your browser, type localhost colon 8000 and this should list all the files in the directory that you were running this command on. Only that, nothing, nothing, not the parent directory and stuff, only that directory will be visible. And all the children folders will also be visible. So how many of you are able to see the directories on your system? Okay. So if you are able to see, what you can do is uh, try to take your friend's laptop's IP and on your machine, try to run his IP colon 8000. Hopefully you don't have anything secret in your downloads folder. <laughs> Okay, I think in some command long ago, the curl, I asked you to write it to an index.html. So if you are running this command in the same directory where that index.html was saved, it will try to serve that instead. It's causing problem for multiple people. So just delete that index.html or go to a different directory. So apparently it also has this additional functionality of serving an index.html file if it finds something by that name. So just delete that index.html, rm index.html or go to a different directory and try this. If you're getting an error saying the site can't be reached uh, and has been moved somewhere else. Ah, same issue, uh, just 
RM the index dot HTML. Uh, it's oh that is running in your in your thing. I shouldn't have said that command. Oh uh, no no no. Uh, is okay. You just go to. Oh no, go back, go back. Just go to uh, like KTS, right? Uh, CD KTS, KTS, Control C. CD KTS. KTS. Ha! Huh, now run from ins. Oh, wait. Is, no, you're not in. So you're in the desktop when that uh, index dot HTML is over here. Just go to downloads instead. And now run. And how to come out from this? Like control C is not command C. Uh, control C. Control tab. <laughs> okay, it is. It's not coming out. Okay, it'll come out in a while. Uh, you can keep that in. Uh, now run from here. Now you can go to localhost. Uh, wait, uh, where, where are you running this command from? This command is in desktop. Hmm. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, Python dash m HTTP server. Where are uh, you? Ran, okay, this is ran the space server. Okay. Hmm. Okay, show of hands, were you able to see your directory listed? If you are seeing the triple ID page, it's because of the indexed HTML. Sorry about the clash of commands. So you are able to see this page, right? And were you also able to see from some your friend's IP as well? Have you tried it with, uh, just get your neighbor, uh, IP and run the same command, uh, don't run any command, go to the browser, that IP colon 8000. Just get your neighbor's IP colon 8000 and you'll be able to see the list of files on their machine as well. So what this is, is just a useful hack for you to share files among yourselves. All you have to do is be connected on the same network. And it doesn't even use your Wi-Fi or data, right? It just uh, it just uses the network without using data from the internet. So you can just share large files quite easily uh, if you're all connected in the same network and just using the Python HTTP server to spin up a quick quick server to serve your port. In fact, I even use this in case you're uh, you're not able to download some stuff within the VM. I was using this on a couple of people's machines to move files from their host machine to inside the VM. Okay, so I guess you've all played with that uh, Python HTTP server. So let's just get into one more concept called REST. You might have heard of this often. REST stands for representation tra state transfer. Basically, it is how you implement HTTP uh, in your, how, how you implement a HTTP server. So REST, uh, it's just a, like, a, like a recommendation that you can use these four operations. They are called CRUD, create, write, read, update, delete and the corresponding rest operations are post, get, put and delete. So it's just a recommendation that you use these uh, four operations for doing anything on resources. Post means it adds something, get you just read it, put is for update and delete is for delete. And so you, 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 you might have heard of these called restful applications or rest API and that is any application that supports all of these four on any of its resources. So this is an example of a Flask application that supports the REST API. Mostly supports the REST API. So you see get, uh, yeah, you get, you see get and post. Uh, you can look at the code. There's uh, in the GitHub. There's this 
a folder called uh, todo underscore app. Uh, to do underscore app, this same server is uh, code is on that. So if you have Python, you can actually run it, uh, run it locally. If you just want to get your hands uh, with some Python code, but basically this just shows how you can implement a REST code, right? So basically uh, REST API. Basically saying get API of uh, get on tasks. You want to be able to call this function. If you want get of a particular uh, query, this is a query parameter they're talking about in the URL then you can use that as an argument in your function and you can do post in which you are able to update uh, resources using this. So uh, I'm not sure how we are on time. How are we on time? We want to take till 1.30, right? Uh, I can do HTTP 2 and then we can come back to this if we are. Should I do, should I continue this hands on thing or should I go to HTTP2 and then come back when we are? How would we on time? It's actually going on. 1.30, we can take lunch till 1.30. Maybe 1.15, we can, 15.20 kind of thing, it's okay. Then I'll do the. We can finish this set of things and then HTTP we can take tomorrow. Uh, then have, I'll just. We have enough time, we have okay. enough time with other things. Okay. We can adjust and we can drop something else, this is mm -hmm. more important than. Okay, so what you can do is uh, go to the to do app and get this Python code. It's called server.py. There's also a readme in the same folder which tells you how to run this. So you can first just run the server. Okay, now first you have to pip install flask uh, so to get flask running and then try to run the server using the instruction given there. Let's just get to that stage uh, first. Second is you re run the readme instructions to do some of these, to run some of these commands. And if you've done that as well, the third is you can try implementing the delete API um, and try to get that to work. So, f so first get the code in um, 23.1.http to do app. There's a server.py there. It's pretty small. You just get that code in your machine. And there is also a readme in that GitHub that uh, has instructions on what to install, how to run the program, and how to test the APIs. Just get to running the program at least first. And if you have any issues, you can raise your hands. So this is just an example of if you want to quickly spin up a web server, this you will probably end up using Python and in Python you will probably end up using Flask. So you can just get your, get uh, familiar with the Flask API and see how to write code to quickly uh, serve a REST API. Are people getting an issue when you do Flask dash dash run? Are multiple people getting this issue? Any issues when you do Flask dash dash app? Okay. Just you. Yeah, if you are having issues with the first command, try running the second command here. So show of hands, were you able to get the first API to work? If you are able to get all three APIs to work, you can try writing the delete uh, command in this server. Uh, try writing the, the function for deleting. It should look similar to the get of an ID but you're going to have to write the Python code to delete a task from that dictionary if you find it. Basically similar to this, this method should be now delete and then you have to write the code for actually doing the delete with the task ID. Able to get it work out. So I hope you're able to see that uh, curl gives you these options, right? Where is my dash x post no, if you don't do any, uh, don't give anything, it will do get by default and then you can use dash x to do the post or delete if you have added the delete function. So I think most of you are in some form or the other, you have understood this code, seen the code or been able to implement the delete API and run it, right? So, so it's mostly, it's mostly done. Uh, so right, right, right. So in case you saw this JSON everywhere, does anyone know what the full form of JSON is? 
I'm hearing something, I can't understand anything. Okay, Siddharth, so you were saying something. Exactly. So JavaScript object notation, it is basically the standard that uh, a lot of things, but especially HTTP uses in order to send data around. So if you had done the curl of the, if you had done this curl here, right, for a curl of the post, you send this data in the form of a JSON so that everybody understands that this is Python code, it understands, even though it is JavaScript object notation, Python understands, it's a standard uh, uh, for a serialization format that everybody understands that this is how your data will look like and this helps you uh, write especially in, in HTTP it helps you send data from across server and client in different languages by agreeing to this format to send the languages in. We will see this about this a little bit more in detail when we do the gRPC uh, uh, session tomorrow.